The next two uh, lectures will be conducted by uh, Dr. Janaki uh, Tarmajan. Uh, uh, the, next, the first uh, lecture uh, uh, will be uh, about imaging spectrum of uh, retro uh, areolar uh, lesions. And the second one, uh, about diagnostic approach uh, to uh, axillary lesion. So good evening. At the end of the day, I'll be just uh, touching two topics briefly. And most of the points have already been covered in the prior two lectures. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank the organizers for having me here, uh, to be, making me a part of this prestigious event. So for the retroirular lesions, we'll be going through the complex anatomy, the lesion visualization by ultrasound. We'll go through the spectrum of retroirular lesions based on age, gender, and clinical presentation, and role of multimodality imaging. So any lesion that is situated at less than two centimeters from the nipple or any lesion involving the nipple areolar region on mammography is termed as a retroirular lesion. It accounts for 8% of the breast carcinomas. It is clinically palpable and it may be missed on mammography and ultrasound. Located behind the nipple areolar complex, it mainly deals with uh, collection and expression of milk during lactation. And it contains approximately five to nine orifices that drain the ducts and lactiferous sinuses. The Montgomery glands that open in the Morgagni tubercles. It consists of smooth muscles, nerve endings, and sapiens plexus. Ultrasound imaging uh, does have its technical challenges. It's mainly because of the acoustic shadowing that leads to geometric shape of the nipple. So it appears as a mass with shadowing. And the ducts, uh, because of the radial orientation of the ducts, we are not able to see it clearly. There is always inter-observer variation in labeling the location. Like one radiologist can call it as a lesion at 12 o'clock, the other one may be calling it as 6 o'clock. So always uh, labeling variation can occur. And ultrasound guided procedures are complicated and less accurate due to increased sensitivity and vascularity. The target may be masked due to local anesthesia and interductal lesion becomes less visible after multiple passes. So how to improve ultrasound scanning? We can use a thick pad of gel. So we'll be able to see the lesion better, but we have to be very quick while doing it. We can optimize the machine settings with adjusted focal zone uh, near the skin. And always we have to compare with the contralateral side, which is very, very important. Proper scanning techniques have been described by Stavros, and I suggest all of you please go through it. Peripheral compression technique is used to see the peripheral retroirular duct segments. The two-handed compression technique is used to visualize the central retroirular duct segments. We can do a roll nipple technique for memory to visualize the memory duct within the nipple and development maneuver is to mobilize interductal material. So what are the conditions that affect the retroirular region? It can be because of developmental anomalies, benign processes like inflammation, infection and tumors and invasive and non-invasive cancers. Uh, Non-specific clinical and radiological presentation is common which leads to delayed diagnosis. And uh, there can be different clinical presentation imaging features, and our role as a breast radiologist depends on predicting the tumor involvement before surgery. Development anomalies can be unilateral or bilateral. It may involve the nipple, breast, or both. It usually present along the milk ridges in the axilla or intramammary fat, and most common is polythelia. We should be able to differentiate between ethelia, emasia, and hypoplasia, and association with syndromes like Pollen syndrome has to be considered. Tuberous deformity of the breast can occur, leading to glandular hyperplasia, and this has to be, uh, we have to note it down so that the patient can be offered a corrective surgery. Under development of the breast, ethelia means the nipple and the areola are absent, but and breast tissue is present. In emastia, nipple, areola, and breast tissue are absent. It can be either because of ectodermal dysplasia or it can be atrogenic. And hypoplasia in which the nipple and areola are present and breast tissue is absent. So these are the conditions wherein the patient can be offered reconstructive surgery after uh, she uh, attains 18 years of age. This, uh, uh, just to show how a tuberous malformation looks like, is contributed by my friend Dr. Tanvi. And uh, this is how a normal breast looks like in case of tubular breast. Usually there is um, the medial as well as the inferior portion of the breast. It's actually uh, maldevelopment occurs. And these patients can be offered, uh, the breasts are usually totic and they can be offered reconstructive surgery. Now, the most common features that uh, of the retroirular lesions are either the patient will present with a mass or pathological nipple discharge. So we're just going to see how it affects different age groups because this is the most simplest uh, classification that I could think of. 
So in pediatric retroviral diseases, it occurs during neonatal, it occurs during premature trilarchy, gynecomastia, can present as a retroviral cyst and abscess, or it can be a pathological nipple discharge. Infant breast is palpable with no gender variation, and it's because of the following maternal estrogen, there is prolactin secretion by the neonatal pituitary, unilateral or bilateral breast enlargement can occur, and there can be transient secretion of the milk in 70% of the term infants, termed as witch's milk. So we have to, it's very, very clear that any infant that is born preterm will not be having milk secretion. Nipples become everted, the areola becomes hyperpigmented, and stimulation at four months occurs due to infant's own hormones, and this usually lasts longer in females due to estradiol. And thereafter, the breast is quiescent up to two years. Then up to eight years, there's not much of a change occurring, and mainly the epithelium line ducts develop with surrounding connective tissue. Idiopathic premature telarchy is seen in females between the age of one to three years, and it is not associated with precocious puberty. It usually regresses, and what is needed is only reassurance. Breast development in adolescence usually uh, begins as telarchy, and the mean age is around 8.9 years. And whenever the breast development occurs uh, uh, in the child of less than eight years of age, it is called premature telarchy. It, it almost comprises 5% of the cases. And when the breast development does not occur up to 13 years, it is called delayed telarchy. Early development can occur with or without precocious puberty. Uh, you should know that estrogen is responsible for development of a duct and as well as adipose tissue, and progesterone leads to alveolar budding and ductal growth. This, uh, especially if you are dealing with pediatric cases, this image has to be there. It's not, uh, since we are not doing it on a regular basis, we may be forgetting it, but always keep this image with you. It's very, very important. Uh, the Tanner's uh, stage one pre prepubertal retroviral uh, bud. As uh, the stage one, two, we can differentiate. Three also we can differentiate. Stage four usually merges with that of the uh, stage five. And in stage five tanners, we see a mature breast tissue contour with disappearance of the central hypochaic nodule. So we had an eight-year-old girl with painful, who presented with a painful right retroviral lump. So what we are seeing is, uh, it's a tanner stage two asymmetric breast development. This is very, very important. This girl was lucky enough because we told her, okay, you've got a, just a normal development. We had another girl who presented with a similar complaints, but when we saw that she was already having a scar on the opposite side, we asked the uh, child's mother, what, what, why is the scar there for? So what she told was, no, six months back, the girl had a similar complaint. She went to a general surgeon. They removed the lesion. They thought it was a tumor. She told it's a benign. So this poor girl, it's an iatrogenic removal of the breast bud, so we should be aware of this condition. We had a 13-year-old male with left breast lump, re tender retroviral lump. These kids are very, very sensitive, so we should be aware exactly regarding what they are undergoing. So this is an unilateral early nodular gynecomastia where only reassurance was needed. So gynecomastia is benign enlargement of the male breast granular tissue. It's the most common breast condition with a prevalence of 32 to 65 percent. It's because of increased estrogen to testosterone imbalance and benign proliferation of ductal and stromal elements can occur. It presents as a palpable abnormality, maybe just focal breast tenderness with subjective burning sensation. It can be unilateral or bilateral, and the DDs include pseudogynecomastia. That, that is, there is only enlarged breast with only fat and no stromal or ductal elements. It's usually a self-limiting condition uh, and becomes quiescent in about two years. And precocious puberty in males with gynecomastia, always the estrogen secreting tumors have to be excluded. Coming to retroviral cyst, on ultrasound, it usually presents as a painless, simple anechoic cyst. It can be complicated by infection, wherein we can see fluid, fluid levels, ecogenic debris, internal septae, as well as internal vascularity. And majority resolves spontaneously with or uh, without conservative management. This was a 16-year-old girl who presented with a tender uh, left retroviral mass, and 5 cc of abscess was aspirated, and she was managed conservatively. In girls, we do uh, mastitis and abscess, they do have a bimodal distribution. The most common organisms being Staph aureus, gram-negative bacilli, strepto, as well as enterobacter. In neonatal mastitis, there is local access through the nipple. In some communities, when a child is born, they give nice massage to the nipple, so that is one of the most common causes. And pediatric mastitis occurs between the age of 8 to 17 years with skin infection, nipple piercing, as well as lactation. Patients usually present with tender breasts with erythema and induration, and ultrasound shows thick and echogenic breast tissue with central vascularity and abscess formation. In that case, proceed with ultrasound-guided drainage. This was a 16-year-old girl who presented with spontaneous left nipple bloodstain discharge. 
Ultrasound was performed that showed multiple dilated ducts with intradactyl vascular ecogenic components and they were seen bilaterally. An MRI breast was performed that also confirmed multiple dilated ducts in the retro area region. Core biopsy confirmed the presence of uh, papillary lesions and subsequently she underwent excision biopsy and this is uh, 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 one of the rare cases of juvenile, uh, bilateral juvenile papillomatosis. So this is a localized proliferative disorder of older adolescents and we do see, we do get peripherally located mobile masses of uh, 1 to 8 centimeters in size. Ultrasound shows peripheral multiple ill-defined masses with multiple simpulses and occasional calcifications. Mammography can be performed in certain cases where it presents as a focal asymmetry with uh, rarely calcifications. And MRI shows lobulated mass with small internal cysts and marked enhancement. This is a high-risk lesion and ideally they need complete wide local excision with monitoring. So this being a young girl, so we just, uh, we are still following her closely. We told we complete your family and then we'll take care of the rest, but with very close monitoring. Coming to the retroirular concerns in males, it usually consists of gynecomastia, can present as a mass or bloody nipple discharge. Any male who is 25 years or older with suspicious palpable breast mass on mammography needs initial evaluation with mammography and the diagnostic ultrasound. And if uh, mass is suspicious, uh, then we have to proceed with guided core biopsy. This was a 60-year-old male who presented with a tender uh, lump in the re left retroirular region. So this. Uh, it's very, very essential for us to ask the history, the duration of the symptoms, because any lesion that is, uh, the, if the tenderness is less than one year, usually it's a early stages of gynecomastia and it is a reversible condition. So this was a case of unilateral early nodular gynecomastia. And the uh, gentleman of 51 years had uh, presented with a uh, right breast tender retroirular lump. So this is a unilateral florid early nodular gynecomastia for which no further imaging was required and no further workup was required. So reassurance is the only thing that was required. We had a 57 year old gentleman who presented with bilateral enlarged breast and the palpable concern was on the right breast. So what we are seeing is a right breast chronic dendritic gynecomastia and left was a pseudogynecomastia. And the 33 year old gentleman had come with long standing breast lump in the, on the right side. So since his di uh, grandmother was diagnosed recently with breast cancer, he came for his evaluation. And this turned out to be a unilateral chronic dendritic gynecomastia and only reassurance was needed. Male of any age which clinical features of breast neoplasm which can be in the form of suspicious mass, axillary lymphadenopathy, nipple discharge and nipple retraction, we have to perform a diagnostic mammography with ultrasound. This was a 49 year old gentleman with recurrent left breast tender lump. He was a chronic smoker. So this, this is a case of recurrent subarular abscess also called as Zushka's disease. A 79-year-old gentleman had presented with left uh, retroirular non-tender lump of one month duration. Ultrasound showed a mass with suspicious features, slightly eccentrically uh, located. This was invasive memory carcinoma luminal B and one of nine lymph nodes were positive. This was an 83-year-old gentleman with progressive left breast lump. So this showed a uh, complex solicystic mass and uh, core biopsy showed a papillary lesion and uh, uh, subsequently was subjected to mastectomy. This was intracystic papillary carcinoma grade 1 luminal laying. Another 68 year old gentleman had presented with left retroirular mass and he was also having a single suspicious lymph node. We proceeded with core biopsy from the mass as well as FNAC from the lymph node. So this turned out to be non-Hodgkin's lymphoma B cell type with high proliferation and cytology also showed hyperplastic lymph node. Coming to the retroirular concerns in females, it can be as much simpler than the other two categories. It can be the cyst, abscess, solid or benign masses. They can present with pathological nipple discharge, about which we've already seen in detail. Or it can be in form of nipple ulceration, can be most common is dermatitis and rarely Paget's disease. This was a 68-year-old lady who had presented with a screening detected right retroirular lump in 2018. So we found out a simple cyst in the region, we called it as benign, and uh, recently when she came for a follow-up, it had completely regressed. So it's very, very essential that we have to follow up the lesions. Another 49-year-old lady had presented with a right breast lump of recent onset. This turned out to be a simple cyst, uh, categorized as by rats too. So we told, we, she doesn't need any imaging follow-up, but in case of clinical symptoms like uh, inflammation, uh, that has to be aspirated. A 30-year-old female lactating, feeding a two-month-old baby, presented with a right breast tender lump. And uh, this was an abscess secondary to lactational mastitis. So evaluation with only ultrasound needs to be performed. 
we had a 46 year old lady with recent onset non tender right retroreal alarm so what we are seeing is um, uh, we did a correlative ultrasound this happens to be a thick walled abscess we have uh, we could see fine internal particles we aspirated it so this was a uh, unique case of granulomatous mastitis with focal separation we performed fnac of the lymph node that should react to lymph nodes there was initial good response to steroids, but ultimately there was progression and excision biopsy was performed that also showed uh, lobular-centric granulomatous mastitis. So in our parts of the country, we do see a lot of this uh, granulomatous mastitis, but uh, most commonly it is seen in the females within six years post-delivery. This was a 34-year-old lady who was lactating, presented with tender right mass and not responding to antibiotics. So any lesion that does not respond to antibiotics and, uh, uh, and uh, lasts for two, more than two weeks, we have to do imaging. And the pinkish fluid was aspirated. This was a chronic abscess and culture sensitivity was performed and she responded later. This was a 47-year-old lady with recent onset right nipple retraction and tender lump. She was nulliparous on an antipsychotic medication. We can see periareolar skin thickening and also we can see multiple lucent uh, structures in the retroareolar region. Ultrasound showed multiple dilated ducts with debris and uh, MRI was performed that showed uh, again, um, inflammatory changes with multiple dilated ducts. So uh, ultra, uh, ultrasound guided core biopsy showed inflammatory mass with separation with ill-formed granulomas and multiple giant cells. She was treated initially with antibiotics followed by prednisolone and tapering dose with complete healing in the, on follow-up. This was a lady who presented with progressive left breast mass and uh, we did a ultrasound showed a nice uh, complex solid cystic mass and the core biopsy showed papillary lesion in favor of papilloma. I think that uh, there will be detailed talk about papilloma tomorrow, papillary lesions. Wide local excision was performed that showed interductal papilloma. So it is very essential that we give the surgeons a diagnosis even before the procedures. And uh, it's an interesting case, a 26-year-old lady who was lactating with soft uh, right breast lump in 2018. This was felt to be a galactoseal and she was put on follow-up. She came to us after uh, three years and she told the lump has become larger in size. So when we did the ultrasound, it, the lump had become more solid, it had become more vascular and, and the skin was also stretched. We did a diagnostic mammography and uh, we also could see another lesion on the opposite, on the left side that was actually isoechoic. And uh, we did a core biopsy from the right breast mass, this, uh, which showed benign phylloids. She was subjected to a wide local excision, but ultimately the final pathology was juvenile fibroadenoma. A 60-year-old lady with right nipple loose, so based on uh, the clinical features itself, this definitely looks like a Paget's disease. Did a mammography that showed pleomorphic calcifications and segmental distribution, and this is a Paget's disease with extensive DCIS. And uh, this was uh, another, um, this another case to illustrate the retroreolar lesions, a 48-year-old lady with a palpable right retroreolar mass. And we can see uh, the mass is not very obvious, but we definitely we can see the calcif suspicious calcifications. And, um, and uh, this was uh, an invasive memory carcinoma grade 3 luminal B, her enriched. And uh, subsequently, mastectomy with central lymph node biopsy also confirmed the findings. This is another case to just to illustrate the kind of calcification seen in retroreolar region. So uh, uh, there was no discrete mass, more of a non-mass area and ultrasound, and we can see associated with calcifications. And core biopsy showed DCIS, and a, um, a subsequent mastectomy showed a DCIS with invasive tumor of 0.3 centimeter size. This was a triple negative breast cancer. A 53-year-old lady who had presented with a right spontaneous serous nipple discharge, and uh, a tubular structure was present in the retroreolar region. Core biopsy showed plasma cell mastitis with the abscess formation. She was offered surgery, but she chose to be on follow-up. So the, uh, Dr. Shilpa has already shown the cases before, a 59-year-old lady with spontaneous nipple discharge. So we can see a nice uh, torture structure in the retroreolar region. Ultrasound showed the mass uh, with the interrelational vascularity, dilated duct. And this was a multicentric complex papilloma with ductal hyperplasia. Another 61-year-old lady presented with right spontaneous nipple discharge. And we can see ultrasound showed two lesions. And this uh, sometimes it's very difficult for us to proceed with biopsy of these lesions in the retroreolar region. But we can always uh, guide the surgeons uh, with skin marking. So this was a solid papillary carcinoma with uh, two fossa of microinvasion. We had a 63-year-old lady with right bloody nipple discharge. Mammography and ultrasound showed multiple dilated ducts with no discrete masses. And uh, definitely the MRI showed us the offending duct. 
and uh, this uh, subsequent excision biopsy, uh, second look ultrasound showed the mass, and subsequent excision biopsy showed the uh, interdictal papillary DCIS. And uh, coming to uh, this actually reminds us of uh, Dr. Lenver, he had mentioned this in the lecture. We had a 35-year-old lady with right retroviral alarm for diagnostic mammography. So what will be the, uh, does it look suspicious? Okay, so this is what we got. Uh, ultrasound showed a mass with probably benign features, but if you see closely, this actually never be satisfied with if you are finding out the lesion. There's another lesion that is located over here, and this definitely looks suspicious. So we did a mammography was performed. Uh, this was too small, and there was a big vessel going through it. So I was really scared to do an ultrasound guided core biopsy because definitely hematoma would have formed. We performed an excision, and this turned out to be an invasive tubular carcinoma. And the initial lesion with which the lady had presented, it's still stable. So she's radiologically stable. Uh, usually it is told that whenever there are lesions in the retroviral region, especially the malignant lesions, we cannot do a breast conservation. So this was a 30-year-old lady with right retroviral lump, and the excision biopsy showed a DCIS. And uh, when we reevaluated, we found she was having uh, restoral lesions and confirmed on MRI. So we went ahead with a skin sparing mastectomy, and um, so in this way we can help the patient to, uh, towards the surgery. So the BIRAS interpretation based on multimodality imaging, the ultrasound findings have to be correlated with mammography and MRI findings for uh, size, shape, location, surrounding tissue composition. We should always al also mention about the quadrant location, the depth and clockwise position, and distance from the nipple in centimeters. There is usually less variation in the distance of the lesion from nipple in different modality since the lesion is in the retroviral region. If the clinical findings are worrisome and mammography is negative, additional ultrasound evaluation is suggested. If there are worrisome clinical concerns with abnormal mammography and if ultrasound is negative, we have to proceed with further workup. So suspected Paget's disease, uh, uh, we have to do a punch biopsy. If it is positive for malignancy, uh, do a diagnostic study. In case of nipple discharge, especially if it is um, uh, non-pathological, uh, uh, look out for the systemic causes and do a medical management. And if it is uh, pathological nipple discharge, do a diagnostic study and proceed accordingly. In case of other symptoms like palpable mass, skin lesions or nipple retraction, uh, patient above uh, 35 years, do a diagnostic study. If below 35 years, then proceed accordingly. And in case of strong clinical suspicion, proceed with MRI breast. And uh, if uh, we don't have any uh, imaging findings, always do a periodic follow-up in accordance with the clinical context. So appropriate techniques are essential to avoid pitfalls in the nipple areolar complex. Diagnosis requires joint assessment of clinical and multimodality imaging findings. Uh, inversion of the nipple usually differs from retraction, and they can occur in both benign as well as malignant conditions. And any inflammatory or infectious conditions require ultrasound follow-up study in four to six weeks to show that the lesions are resolving. And in case of doubt, always biopsy. So this is the first part. I think now we'll just go to the second one. So. I think I'll be continuing with the second one because the next two lectures. Okay, so coming to the diagnostic approach to axillary lesions, the Dr. Lewin has already covered all the uh, um, lymph nodes. So I won't be touching much on that. So the relevant anatomy, imaging appearance of axillary lymph nodes, etiology, image-guided interventions, and algorithm. So already we know the axilla as such contains axillary veins, arteries, and branches, the brachial plexus and branches, intercostal nerves, lymph nodes, and uh, fat and fibrous tissue and vestigial breast tissue. So this we already seen regarding the level 1, 2, and 3 nodes, so I won't be going through it again. Normal architecture. This is very important because, uh, especially for the abnormal lymph nodes, uh, they do enter through the afferent via the afferent lymphatic. So we can see metastasis in the subcapsular sinus. 
So and also once they involve, so this appears as a focal cortical thickness, and this is uh, when the lymph nodes uh, are uh, the cortex is involved. This appears as a diffuse cortical thickness, and uh, this pattern usually gives a uh, heterogeneous appearance. And whenever they extend, extend out, it's called extra capsular extension. So the imaging modalities like ultrasound, mammography, what we see on MRI, and also PET CT, uh, the CT imaging when we which we use for staging. And uh, ultrasound features we already gone through, so I'm not going through again. But only one thing what I uh, what I wanted to add from the uh, is uh, usually the focal cortical thickness of three millimeters or diffuse cortical thickness of five millimeters. That is what the cutoff we keep uh, for uh, visualizing for further worker. So normal shape, this is the abnormal shape, and the cortical thickness, and the, again the uh, this is the presence of irregular margins. So here actually the lymph node itself starts acting as a second primary, and from there it goes. This should not be confused to be a secondary uh, second ma mass. Blood supply again we have seen in detail, and the fa displacement of fatty phylum is also done. And uh, metastatic deposits that measure less than 0.2 millimeters are called isolated tumor cells. We should be aware of these things which we uh, see in the report. The deposits between 0.2 to 2 millimeters are called micrometastasis, and this level of disease is not identifiable at imaging. So, if any tumor board, if the pathology, if, the, if we are told, okay, you could not identify this on imaging, we can always say maximum we can see something which is more than 3 millimeters. Anything below that, we won't be able to see. So, abnormal lymph nodes and mammography, the size being more than 2 centimeters, they can be round or irregular with speculated margins. Fatty hilum may be absent, they can be dense lymph nodes. On MRI, again, uh, short axis dimension of more than one centimeter, round shape, eccentric cortical thickness, and the, the, there is abnormal enhancement on T1-weighted images. And like this one of the rotos lymph node based on MRI breast. And uh, now we come to the etiology based on tissue of origin. It can be nodal, uh, the lymph node can be in the, either in the form of metastasis or lymphoma, and non-nodal uh, with various reasons that uh, causes that we'll be seeing in detail. The nodal causes include uh, lymph nodal origin. Most common is reactive lymphadenopathy that occurs in up to 24% of the cases. It can be infectious, it can be like an abscess arising in a lymph node. It can be miscellaneous causes like autoimmune connective tissue disorders, dermatopathy conditions, foreign body, uh, usually the silicon granuloma, lymphoproliferative disorders. It can be malig of malignant origin in almost 23% of the cases. It can be the uh, distant metastasis, regional spread, uh, lymphoma, leukemia. Reactive lymphadenopathy is usually secondary to local skin and soft tissue infections or systemic infections on inorganic dust like silica. And TB is seen in almost, uh, the TB of lymph nodes are seen in almost, uh, uh, consists of 8% in developed world. And usually they present with internal echoes, calcifications, and they are unilateral. So this was an 81-year-old lady who presented with right axillary lump. Her breasts were fairly normal. We can see an axillary uh, 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 mass in the axilla. Ultrasound showed a collection. We uh, proceeded with aspiration, or almost 25 ml of pus was aspirated. That was positive for AFP smear in culture. She was put on AKT, and she uh, subsequently recovered. This is just to show uh, a patient with the right um, a known case of right breast carcinoma and she was on surveillance. So PET CT was performed and that showed a, um, a avid lesion on the, in the left axilla. So ultrasound, uh, we did an ultrasound, we found out this mass, uh, this enlarged lymph node. We did an ultrasound guided FNAC and that showed granulomatous lymphadenitis. So not all enlarged lymph nodes are malignancy. This has to be kept in mind. We had a lady who, who had a biopsy proven left breast uh, malignancy and uh, her lymph node was showing focal cortical thickness. We did a FNAC and that showed granulomatous features. So the surgeon went ahead with a central lymph node biopsy. And uh, finally, we have got, uh, it was a case of sarcoidosis in the lymph nodes with no metastasis. Metastasis to the lymph nodes, uh, main, uh, the most common cause is from the breast, or it can be non-breast causes also as uh, primary from the lung, head, neck, face, stomach, ovary, or ipsilateral arm. This was a 50-year-old lady with right axillary swelling. Even though she was having um, multiple benign masses, but the lymph nodes were definitely suspicious. We did a core biopsy that showed metastatic carcinoma, luminal B. We, uh, entire workup was done. MRI was negative for the mass. And this was actually, despite uh, we could not find out the primary at all. So in these cases, what we did was uh, the patient was given NACT. 
and the axillary lymph node dissection was done with whole, followed by whole breast and the axillary RT. So we did not opt for a mastectomy in this case because we could not find the primary. But we gave whole breast RT to the breast with only axillary lymph node dissection. So it's very, very essential that we interact closely with the multidisciplinary team. This is just to show a patient with melanoma uh, in the right upper limb with metastasis to the axilla. And another case, uh, male who pres uh, of uh, lung, uh, lung carcinoma who presented with axillary swelling and uh, subsequently the metastasis was proven by FNAC. Lymphoma presents as axillary lymphadenopathy in almost 30% of the cases and the initially it is the axillary lymph nodes are the initial manifestation in almost 9%. The NHL affects lymph axillary lymph nodes more commonly as compared to the Hodgkin's lymphoma. In ultrasound, we see them as round uh, lymph nodes that are hypoechoic, and hilum is usually preserved in almost 72% of the cases. Perinodal edema and calcifications are uncommon, and there can be mixed hilar and peripheral vascularity. That is, they usually they appear hyperemic. This was a 57-year-old lady with left breast enlargement and uh, axillary lump of two months duration. So initially we thought, okay, she has got a, uh, we could not find out any mass, but definitely there was skin thickening and we could see some lesion in the, uh, along the posterior aspect. Lymph nodes were enlarged. We proceeded with uh, biopsy. This was a high grade non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, double expressor type. And a uh, few other examples to show lymphoma of the axillary lymph nodes. Uh, coming to the non-nodal causes. Accessory breast tissue origin is very common, consist, uh, it's the most common consisting of almost 19%. It can be normal fibroglandular tissue or it can be lesions arising within the breast tissue, can be in the uh, form of fibroadenoma, fat necrosis, carcinoma or breast abscess. Axilla is the most common site for accessory breast tissue and it can be continuous with the breast tissue or can present as a separate discontinuous structure or it can uh, even form a complete breast rarely. Accessory nipples are occasionally present and uh, breast cancer can occur anywhere along the remnant milk ridge. This is an axillary breast tissue in the form of uh, axillary fat pad that can be unilateral or bilateral. And uh, axillary fat pad with accessory parenchymal tissue, again it can be asymmetric or symmetric in continuation with the breast tissue. This was a 42 year old lady who presented with a left breast lump. So uh, tomo uh, synthesis shows a uh, fat containing um, area and this actually turned out to be a hematoma. So you can see a nice fat containing, uh, this was a palpable concern. So this was a fat containing oval mass mixed in, uh, mixed ecogenic. And this was a, a classical case of hematoma. This subsequently excised because of her uh, clinical concerns. This was a lady who had multicentric uh, biopsy proven right breast neoplasm. And uh, during the workup, we also found out a uh, lesion in the right axillary region. And uh, this one, uh, the subsequent mastectomy specimen showed this to be a fibroadenoma. So just to show a fibroadenoma in the axillary region. And this was a 36-year-old lady who was high risk and she had a developing, uh, uh, palpable, uh, developing palpable lump in the right axillary region. And uh, this turned out to be a benign phylloidson core biopsy. Another 43-year-old lady had presented with recent onset right axillary lump and she had a history of left breast excision biopsy for phylloids three years back. And uh, this is the lump uh, on tomosynthesis sequences. Uh, it was complex, actually, a complex polycystic mass. We did a core biopsy that initially showed myofibroblastoma. Wide local excision was performed, and this was a case of borderline phylloids. We have been coming across a lot of these phylloids that occur bilaterally. So I don't know if it's, uh, it has been observed all over the world, but in India, at least in the recent one year, we have seen a lot of bilateral phylloids that occur at different times. So always that uh, possibility has to be keep, kept in mind. This was a 55-year-old lady with right axillary lump, and definitely we can see a suspicious mass with calcifications, and this turned out to be a DCIS with microinvasion. Another 70-year-old lady presented with a right axillary lump, and definitely this uh, is a suspicious mass, there is no doubt, with skin retraction. And uh, this was an invasive mammary carcinoma grade 3, almost 5 centimeters in size, and uh, it also had DCIS with one lymph node positive. A 43-year-old lady had presented with lump in the left axillary region, and this was the mass with partially circumscribed margins and uh, uh, interesting, uh, poorly vascular. And this turned out to be one of the rare cases of medullary carcinoma, uh, invasive carcinoma with medullary pattern in the axilla that actually is quite rare. And this was a luminal B, but with a very high proliferative index. 
coming to the other uh, lesions of other origin like angiomatous it can be either hemangioma or angiosarcoma lymphatic origin can be lymphangioma neural uh, can be schwannoma adipose lipoma and liposarcoma are uh, relatively common muscular causes include rhabdomyosarcoma and rhabdomyoma and uh, the other, some of the lesions i have also not seen except in their textbooks and the cutaneous origin include infectious soft tissue abscess or uh, epidermal inclusion cyst this was a 60 year old lady who had lumpectomy uh, with uh, followed by rt in 2013 and she presented with progressive left axillary mass of eight, uh, 18 months duration fnc performed elsewhere was inconclusive with only blood blood clot this is the mass seen in the axillary region and the ultrasound also showed a mass but we could not identify the vascularity but uh, uh, we are not sure of the origin of the uh, the posterior extent of the mass so that's why we asked for an mri breast mri chest and uh, we could see that it was an uh, uh, enhancing mass with multiple uh, vascular uh, malformations so excision biopsy was performed this turned out to be secondary angiosarcoma low to intermediate grade Uh, this was a 40 year old lady with right axillary swelling and uh, mammography was unremarkable but ultrasound showed a um, cystically dilated uh, structure this turned out to be lymphangioma another lady with recent uh, progress of right axillary swelling and fnac elsewhere showed hyperplastic lymphadenitis so here our technicians are very uh, means we should uh, if you are having a good technologist half our work is done she told that whatever lump she could feel it's not included ultrasound was performed that showed a really large mass actually cystically dilated mass in the axillary region uh, cross sectional imaging was performed in ct we can see mass with enhancing internal septations and uh, this turned out to be um, um, lymphomascular malformation with uh, acute and chronic inflammation another 42 year old lady with a palpable left axillary lump we can see that this actually fat containing mass and she also had a couple of lymph nodes within it's a lipoma this lady had right axillary swelling of 7 years duration and we can see that uh, the skin is also stressed and probably when we did the ultrasound we thought okay maybe this is a punctum which is leading to the skin we labeled it as sebaceous cyst it was excised but uh, finally histopathology showed it to be a mature lipoma and uh, 6 year old lady for routine screening just to show how a skin wart develops and uh, this lady had a progressive left axillary swelling ultrasound showed a mass uh, that is poorly vascular we did a core biopsy that showed keratin like material and uh, biopsy proven uh, is a giant epidermoid cyst post traumatic surgical procedures can occur in the form of localized collections of serous fluid it can be lymphatic or blood mammography shows an equal density mass with irregular margins when soft and it's a, it appears as a high density mass with circumscribed margins when tense and uh, the hematoma the hematoma the collection seen it uh, on ultrasound it usually evolves with age so it's anechoic when it is hyperacute it can uh, the acute uh, hemato acute lesions can be hypoechoic with low level echoes when it is subacute we can see irregularly marginated cystic spaces and chronic uh, collections they are usually hypoechoic with thick irregular walls so this is 74 year old lady with left lump uh, incision biopsy with involved margins and what we are seeing is actually a subacute hematoma subacute seroma this is an interesting case and like we told we need to have very good technologist this was a 77 year old lady who presented with a right breast palpable lump and this was along the axillary anterior axillary line in 2019 so this was not included in mammography and uh, when we did an ultrasound we can we could see a mass with uh, suspicious features but we could also see that the mass was located along a scar she was having an enlarged lymph node core biopsy showed invasive mammary carcinoma with necrosis triple negative with a prolif high proliferative index fnac was also suggestive of a metastasis but somehow something did not click in because it was not seen on mammography so when we checked the uh, her prior history we found out that uh, she had a history of ca sigmoid in 2010 and she had lung metastasis in 2017 that was resected by vats so what uh, the lesion had developed actually it was along the site of Uh, vats that was performed for the uh, th uh, resection so what we uh, the, uh, we uh, asked the uh, pathologist to review the marker so this turned out to be a rare case of uh, metastasis from the uh, ca sigmoid along the track of vats and that has further uh, subsequently metastasized to the lymph node so this there actually this lady was planned for mastectomy uh, this one breast surgery but because we could intervene and tell that this is a metastasis it was totally uh, her management changed so it's very very essential to take the 
technologists into consideration and whatever they are saying, we have to believe them and go and uh, have a second look. So the guided interventions can be done either with 21 or 22 G needle, uh, uh, 14 or 16 uh, guided core biopsy. And we have to take the lymph node that is most suspicious and the highest level in case of suspected malignancy. So management of axillary lymphadenopathy, I think we've already gone through it. So if it's uh, on screening with unilateral, we have to, uh, bilateral ultrasound has to be performed. And if in case of known, uh, no infectious diseases, known infectious diseases, uh, we have to proceed with the biopsy of the lymph node. If a benign cause is found out, we can ask for a follow-up in uh, six months. In case of bilateral axillary lymphadenopathy with no suspicious breast findings, always correlate with patient history and clinical examination. In case of underlying infections, um, term it as benign. If known lymphoma, then Birax assessment should be based on breast findings. And if known benign, benign cause can be find, uh, found out, proceed with biopsy. This is a management of axillary lesions. I'm not going through it in details. So, so take home message is ultrasound is the preferred modality for assessing the lymph nodes. And lymph node cortical thickness and uniformity are the most important criteria for distinguishing normal nodes from abnormal ones. So if an abnormal lymph node is found, the ipsilateral breast and contralateral axilla should be closely examined and the patient's medical history should be reviewed. Various mimics of axillary lymphadenopathy may prompt imaging workup and should be included in differential diagnosis of palpable abnormality. If a patient with known malignancy, normal nodal morphologic features uh, does not necessarily permit the exclusion of metastatic disease for differential diagnosis, always a central lymph node biopsy may be needed. The references and thanks.